Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today on the show, we're rejoined by Anthony Power, an independent mining analyst. We talk about Argo blockchain and Core Scientific's recent financial warnings. After the recording of this podcast, we also found out new information about Iris Energy's precarious financial position, including the inability to pay for a $103 million ASIC back loan from NYDIG. That information is briefly touched on in this podcast, but certainly more information came to light afterwards. Anthony, welcome back to The Mining Pod. Things have certainly changed since last time we talked and have certainly changed since some of the articles that you've written for Mining Memo over the summer, highlighting a lot of the debt issues for miners. Now we're seeing some of that debt come home to roost. We have Core Scientific issuing a notice last week. Uh, that article can be found on Bloomberg saying that they are having troubles paying some of their debts. They will not be paying service providers for October and November. And then this morning, we found out from new documentation from Argo blockchain that they might have to shut down operations for a temporary period due to a lack of good financials. And then there's a few other miners that we'll get to at the end of this conversation. Uh, They're also in a bad debt position. They're mining Bitcoin, maybe profitably, maybe not. They have debt payments to make. They still need to pay for the energy to mine that Bitcoin every month. It is a scary market for public miners out there. Uh, but I'll hand it over to you. Let's first start with the Argo blockchain news. Can you give me a little recap for our listeners and then let's dig into the analysis of their books? Yeah. Um, so Argo blockchain, I was very fortunate earlier this year in, in May. I just got back from the, the Alternative Investment Summit in London where I met quite a few of the CEOs and, and chief mining officers of some of the, the big mining companies in North America. And I had a call book with, with Peter Wall, uh, the CEO of Argo, and his CFO, Alex Appleton. And we talked through a, a whole range of topics about performance, about strategy. But one of the areas that we did um, put, put, put on, the, on, on the discussion was, was the level of debt. And you know, it's notable that they started to increase levels of debt. And actually, a lot of it was down to the shareholders not wanting to, them to go down the continued dilute route. Um, so 2021, Argo had, had, had diluted in the region of about 180 million shares that year, um, 300,000 at the start of the year, 400, nearly 480, sorry, 300 million at the start of the year, 480 million at the end of the year. And so I think Peter was taking on board some of that sort of like um, um, discussion that was, in, was was happening on the various social media. And we were seeing them, you know, take on a, num- a number of different um um, debt from from different companies, and I've done some sort of like very basic calculations, uh, looking at what they'd be paying back in 2022 and 23 in preparation for the chat with both of them. And I said, look, you know, I'm working out this year, and it's May now, and I think you've got about 30 million this year and nearly 50 million next year to make on the debt servicing. Are you, are you comfortable? That's a, you know, that's going to be managed with Bitcoin as it's sort of dropping in value um, since November highs of 69,000 a coin. And both of them actually sort of, yeah, we're, we're happy. We, you know, we, we, we're comfortable with that level. Um, we don't see it being an issue. Uh, we're comfortable on on the trajectory on the trajectory of Bitcoin. And so, to be honest with you, I, I, I left it there at that. You know, that they've come back with a response. I then get to the quarter two um, financials, and I go through the financials. Now, I can now go and look at all the debt they've got then, and, and the financials basically tell you. You know who the debts were, then you can you can go back through all the um, announcements to to determine when the debt was taken out, when the um, uh, how long the debt's for over a period, and what the interest rates on. And being an accountant, I'm able to very quickly I I can come up with a payment structure very easily. So I just thought I'd start putting these in a table. And I wasn't just looking at Argo blockchain; I was looking at a few of the miners. I included. And bit farms, and I included Greenwich Mining. When I got finished the tables, what what was highlighted was um, all three had, had got significant amounts of debt, and more importantly, was how that debt's being repaid <clears throat> between now and the end of the debt. And you now we found with um, Argo Blockchain, it was it was quite significant, and those numbers I'd sort of like quickly worked out were, were sort of starting to prove very much more realistic, and so. As we were getting each monthly update through with the amount of Bitcoin being mined, 
I'm having a sort of like thinking, well, they've got to pay an energy cost here, which is um, at least half the um, the cost of the of the, of the of the of the Bitcoin mining, and they've got to pay the staff, and they've got to pay the facility, and they've got another other cash charges they've got to meet, and they've got this interest and capital repayment from the debt side of it. So you've got to physically make that. And in Argo's case, it's like you know four million dollars a month. You know, I put I, I put my article together and I put it into the public domain to say, you know, um, need to think about this, and um, you know, it's it, it could be an issue going forward if Bitcoin continues to drop. How are some of these miners going to maintain their um, committed payments, their required payments? Move that forward to the um, end of September when we get the, um, the 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 updates from Argo, and we have an, an update. Not the monthly update, but we had an update to say they were having to look at a number of ways where they could strategically um, help their financial position. So some of that was about selling some miners on the market to raise some cash. Some of that trying to renegotiate some of their um, um, interest payments with their with their creditors. And another area was actually looking at an undisclosed um, investor who potentially was. Um, maybe going to purchase, I think it was like 87 million shares at around 27, uh, 27 pence a share, um, raising $27 million, 24 million UK pounds, $27 million. And that more information would be um, brought out within the next 30 days. So it was a sort of quiet period for 30 days while that was happening. And so that immediate NRS, RNS put a drop on the share price, which was, I think, 33 pence the day before it was announced, and it, and it dropped then to lower than the actual price that the, the unnamed investor was prepared to offer for the, for the shares. So um, a lot of shareholders were then sort of getting agitators to, you know, what's going to happen with this and kept in the quiet. Um, the monthly update came out, and again, um, that explained, um, you know, a little bit about what they've been doing with regards to miners and how many they were deploying and how many were selling. And then today, this morning, we had a, a further RNS update, um, and basically that said that the the unnamed investor wasn't prepared at this moment to go forward with the investment at the terms that they had agreed, that had arranged in the previous update um, last month. So. We saw the share price today drop a further 50%. And effectively, since the first update about about four or five weeks ago, we've seen the share price drop 75% in that, in that, in that period. So it, it, from a market perspective, it hasn't gone down well. Added to that, they've sold more machines. And when I say machines, they're selling um, S19J Pros that are still in the boxes. These are brand new machines. They've sold, I think, nearly 4,000 of these machines at about $13 to $14 a tera hash. And, and will you be able to tell me? I don't know what that means in terms of the normal market rate at the moment, but what, what do you see? Um, is, that, is that a discounted rate to what the market's offering the market? Or have they, have they managed to sort of you know, get the market rate? Yeah, we're seeing an interesting dynamic right now with ASIC prices because of these mass sell-offs. We're starting to see there's a definitely a discount included. So... Before Core Scientific and Argo, I think we we're seeing a nominal rate around eighteen to twenty dollars per tera hash for machines. It sort of depended who you knew, where to go, how many machines you're going to purchase, that sort of thing. Uh, then we saw the Core Scientific news. I heard that they were selling from one of their facilities for as low as sixteen dollars per tera hash, and then this one was certainly lower at around thirteen dollars per tera hash. The interesting thing to note here of course, is some of these units are still in boxes, brand new, not open, just shipped from China immediately. Some have been on the racks, already hashing for a while. Uh, and then it's also the different model types, right? So you mentioned S19J Pro. That's a great model that has you know three to five year lifespan ahead of it. it can mine a ton of Bitcoin for a very efficient rate. Uh, but there's also S19 XBs to consider, which have been sold throughout the summer. I think you mentioned in an article even that... Uh, you know, Bitfarm sold a decent amount of their S19XPs, and there's been a, some other private sales of S19XPs or people are getting those off their books. That being said, they're more efficient, so people might want them in a few weeks come here if Bitcoin's price keeps going down and we see energy rates go up. 
But yeah, I think you did a great job of summarizing everything that's been going on with Argo blockchain. Definitely some unwelcome news this morning for anyone who's invested in the firm. The fun thing to add, I suppose, is, is that they've also said that um, they are looking at other lines of investment um, to, to get some cash flow back into the company to make it viable over the next sort of 6, 12 months. Um, however, if, if that's not forthcoming, then you know there's a point in time in a, in a very near future that they're going to run out of cash and, and effectively they're going to have to stop operations. So in a similar way that Core Scientific announced, or, well, actually it was announced on, on their behalf of the market that they were going to, um, you know, they're in a position where they could be ceasing operations and going for Chapter 11. Um, Argo are coming out with a very sort of like similar statement, you know, literally a couple of weeks later. Um, I mean, obviously, two big North American miners, um, you know, with 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 both of them have got significant um, creditors on board. You, you could almost suggest that you know it's 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 getting it's getting the creditors to be proactive in discussing how this can be how this can go forward. I mean, a lot of these loans are collateralized against mining machines. So, you know, when when Argo um, took out sixty six million dollars of loans with NIDIG, They've collateralized that against um, S19 machines. So, you know, do they come in and withdraw the machines, at, you know, or is it a case of it might get them both parties back to the table and look to discuss how they can sort of like come up with a solution that, that um, for both in this current current time now, and maybe if things get better in the future, they can they can look to, you know, maybe repay back some of the of the of the um, of the expected profit to 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 these or to the creditors at that point in time but they're not able to survive at the moment if they were to meet these payments um you know we found both argo and core scientific most of their mind um bitcoin is having to is having to go on 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 capital on capital on servicing of the debt effectively um and and and, and you, you notice both have sold significant amounts of their hodl since um, from about May onwards, when when things started to change with regards to the price of Bitcoin, starting to really drop less, and and to a certain extent, for some miners, for, for in fact for the for the majority of miners, start becoming unprofitable to mine. From a when you look at all the costs that you've got to incur, so you know the accounting in me looks at sort of like gross margin. So I'm looking at the the, the cost of um, the, the, the the revenue received from mining Bitcoin. Versus the direct costs associated with mining that Bitcoin, so the energy costs and the engineers servicing the miners at the location and some site costs. But there's lots of other costs involved there. You've got all the admin staff, the directors, et cetera, et cetera. That costs have to be met as well. And that's more of operating costs, or some people term it as, as, as overhead costs. And so, you know, these companies have to meet all their cash costs. And so when you start looking through their quarterlies, um, and I had a look through the quarter twos. There wasn't many miners. I only found three miners out the level that I normally analyze that were actually, having met their cash requirements, still had something left over from the revenues. Um, and so, you know, at Bitcoin, at, at sort of like at the currently at the, the sort of twenty thousand mark, it's it's not it's not high enough to, for them to you know for, for all the miners to achieve enough enough to cover everything they need to do. So you know. Um, great when it was in a bull run last year, going all the way up to sixty nine thousand. But now we see the other side of it, the challenges, and um, you know some of these miners haven't all of them haven't all of them have gone through a bear market to just see how the the best strategy to 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 play out during that period. Well, let's look through some of the numbers here on a fifty two week high percent change. Core Scientific is down the most, down ninety eight point six three percent. This is as of Monday, October thirty first. Stronghold is next at 97%, Mawson 97%, Greenidge 96%, Argo down 95%. Uh, the list continues. The the winningest losers in terms of public markets right now are CleanSpark and Marathon Digital at 84% and 84% respectively. A few notes of commentary on this. First is Bitcoin mining stocks trade as a beta play. So they're going to go up higher than Bitcoin here in the good times and go lower than Bitcoin during the bad times. This is just known about Bitcoin mining stocks if you're buying into it or have bought into it. I hope you did know that. 
beforehand, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel for this reason. That being said, some of these miners are hitting precarious bottoms where you know they might not be able to pull back out. We've already seen some delisting notices from NASDAQ uh, for a few of these miners, and some of them seemingly may not be able to get out of that hole at all. They're just basically trading as penny stocks at this point and will continue to trade there. And then once you're delisted, well, your liquidity drives even more up because you can't have anywhere to go sell your stock. Uh, so that could be even more trouble for a few more miners. Uh, let's talk about Core Scientific for a second. I think you did a great job summarizing all the uh, current struggles with Argo uh, from our position. I hope them the best. Uh, I think Argo Blockchain has a very solid team and they had a very solid uh, move with their Helios site. Uh, has some interesting technology built in there. Uh, so we'll see what happens with them. We'll consider watching them in the future. Core Scientific, that was the big news last week. The biggest thing about them is they have a billion dollars in credit lines open that they have to pay. Uh, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, unfortunately, but there's a great article from the blog that I'll link to in the podcast notes showing the breakdown of different people they owe money to. Uh, this includes Mass Mutual, B. Riley, Nidig, and some others. Uh, we, again, a billion dollars in debt. And some of these interest rates are in the mid-teens. And they're not able to service those payments. So the board made a decision to not pay for October and November. And now they're going through possibly some restructuring with that. Core Scientific, of course, uh, as listeners of the show will know, is the largest miner in North America with about 30 exahash online, half of that being self-mining, half being hosted or about there. Uh, so it's a huge hole in the hash rate for the network if they stop producing. We don't know at this point if they are actually shutting down any of their mining. Uh, but Anthony, I want to throw it over to you, get your take on this. You were chatting to me right before the show about how you might think that there is actually a way out of this situation for these debt-heavy miners like Argo and like Core Scientific, that they might have a strategy behind what they're doing. Yeah, I think there's, I think you know to a certain extent that they're letting the creditors know very openly, both of them, that they're going to have problems meeting the these repayments coming up. And Core have already turned around and said at the end of October and November they're not going to meet any of their interest payments or, or, or capital elements of those payments because they just don't have the have the funding. I believe they're literally selling Bitcoin as fast as they can as they can actually mine it to cover off other costs that they have to meet as well. Um, so they're they're letting the creditors know. And you know, again, we just mentioned before about you know these loans will be leveraged against um, against items or miners mining rigs. Or, 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 in some cases, if it's with Galaxy, it could be leveraged with Bitcoin itself. But I think it's. I think for both Argo and um, Argo and, and Core Scientific, I think it's more more the machines. So, what's the what's the best interest for the creditor? Is it a case of you know um, go after the assets and try to come up with a plan themselves, or is it a case of let's let's see if we can discuss and go through a, an arrangement whereby we give these companies a bit more time. Um, we are seeing a stabilizing of the Bitcoin price. So it's been hovering around 19, 20,000 for, for the last two months now. So we're not seeing it continually drop. And, you know, we're sort of seeing a few green shoots, um, you know, whether whether we get any further momentum going upwards on that, which would be a real help to some of these miners. I don't know. Um, but, you know, by openly letting them their creditors know I think they're sort of like you know looking to try and come up with a, a an amicable solution going forward and see if they can sort of like maybe renegotiate or come up with some terms that would be acceptable to the creditors. Um, and, you know, half of something is better than the whole of nothing. Um, and and it, you know, of course, scientific goes to chapter eleven, and we've already seen you know the fire sell on some of these these uh, mining rigs. As you already explained, the prices and there appears to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of miners sat in boxes in Texas at the moment. Um, I'm hearing from a number of sources, and um, you know that means there is a, a lot of inventory out there, which means that only means one thing: the price comes down even further. Because if you've got quite a lot of supply, and people haven't necessarily got all the money to pay for it, then you, you, the price comes down. I mean, we were talking not long ago. I think you mentioned Stronghold. Stronghold paid eighty or ninety dollars a terahash last December, and now we're talking, you know, maybe 
you know, seventeen, eighteen dollars on the market for 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 the same machines. Um, so, I think I think there's there's you know this open and frank discussion that Core are looking for. They they've got this billion you know billion dollars debt. Their, their interest payments alone, so the interest alone was twenty seven million in quarter two. So that, that's just the interest element. They have to make a payment on the debt as well, so the capital element of the debt as well. So that will be a significant amount. We put it into context with Argo. Argo, if Argo were having a, a four million payment, one million of that was interest, and three million was was actually the uh, was the principal payment. So actually, part of the repaying the loan, a bit like your mortgage, you have a repayment mortgage every month. You pay part interest, part capital to reduce the, the balance on the house. Mine's are exactly the same with their loans. So each month they pay at the start, it's small amount of capital, large amount of interest. But as you pay more and more of the loan off, it, it reverses around. It's the same payment throughout the period, but the way it's calculated, you end up paying very small amount of interest at the end because you, you owe small amounts at the end and large amounts of capital come off there. But um, yeah, it, it, if you're using the same principle for core, it means that Effectively, every quarter, Core are having to find a hundred million just to cover their um, their 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 principal and their in interest payments. And if we, I think we mentioned on the last podcast, if you look at the balance sheet for Q two, and we'll see these revised for Q three uh, during November when most of them uh, release their results. But in Q two, we spoke about Core Scientific's current liabilities. So this is what they owe during the next twelve months. Five hundred million dollars over the next twelve months. That was at quarter two, so that figure will be really interesting to look at and compare that to the current assets that they've got in the same period. I think in quarter two they had about five hundred million in current assets, so it was pretty much balanced out. No, no wiggle room in there. But let's see what that looks like in quarter three because those assets, some of those asset assets, might be devalued now. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see. And you know, um, in the article, I included um, Bit Farms. Bit Farms, at that point in time in August, um, looking again through their quarter two uh, filings, and, and and Bit Farms literally have all their loans highlighted, all their interest rates, all their payment periods. So it's very very straightforward to look and calculate their numbers. They were sort of like close to a hundred. Close to 100 million at, at quarter two, but they've actually repaid about 23 million of their of their capital debt in quarter three. So they made a, a decision to start reducing some of their their loans with the highest rates of interest, and some of their loans mm -hmm. have interest rates of 17, 18 percent, which is which is phenomenal. So they've they, they're down to probably about a 70 million in terms of um, in terms of um, debt now on, on the balance sheet. And the question, you know, the question is, is that is that manageable? I know you've had a recent discussion with with Ben, and and um, I get the impression that that's that's manageable for them at the moment. But it's only manageable because, bit, you know, they with their mining at the moment, that that you know they've got coming up to five exahash of um of of hash rate, aim to be six hash, exahash by the end of the year. So they've probably got the plan to to get that Bitcoin, in. and they and they do, you know, they do produce good updates monthly. They have the best. Best monthly update from the miners for September in terms of of actual productivity by exahash deployed. So they have they have they were the number one miner and they've been number one miner for five of the of the nine months this year. So very consistent in their uh, operational updates. Um, whereas you know Argo haven't had that consistency, haven't had that high level of of, of, of return. Um, and the other thing affecting that. You know, for Argo is is the cost of the energy. So in Texas, it's been a real challenge with energy costs. If you haven't got a fixed price agreement, you're paying spot rates, and so you're probably turning your machines off quite a lot during, especially during the, the months of June through to September, because that's when it's really hot. And you know, you're being good um, social miners by you know turning off when the demand is high, but you're also turning off because you can't afford to mine at certain periods when the price. And the price spikes, and that might even be at you know non-high demand levels. Um, so they've been turning off a lot more than say the likes of Bit Farms. Hence, their productivity is something like two thirds of of Bit Farms's production. So Bit Farms seem to have at the moment managed to get to get through the the, the, month, the months 
you know, pe- meeting their debt requirements. Arg- Argo have obviously struggled. Core Scientific have struggled, um, even though they're – and I, th- I think, if I'm right, I think their total hash rate at the moment deployed for self-mining and for hosting is about 22 exahash. Their plan is to get their plan is to get to thirty. Um, if, that, if that's still the plan in the current climate, I don't know. But they they've they've got um, they've got a quite significant amount of self mining and, and and actually quite a lot of host hosted customers as well. So a lot of a lot of people involved with what happens in the near future with Core Scientific. Um, another miner that you know probably we haven't spoke about, but does have quite a lot of debt. Over the next sort of eighteen months, is Iris Energy. Um, I, I did some looking through their through their quarterlies, and and they've got some short term debts. So the short term debt is that debt that, that's got to be repaid over the next twelve months, and longer term debt, which is effectively that debt which needs to be paid over over a twelve month period. And when I looked at the numbers and theirs, um, I was coming up with payment monthly payments of nearly six million dollars. Now. That's a significant amount when in September they achieved about 6.2 million in revenue. So it's just worth keeping your eye on. Again, Iris Energy, like Bit Farms, amazing monthly updates. They've grown 460% in the last 10 months from a, from a hash rate perspective. So they were, they were at 600 petahash earlier in the year. They're at 3.7 exahash now. Um, and they have a plan to get to um, six exahash by by early twenty twenty three. So growing in the right direction. Got a good management team at Iris Energy. Impressed that they've got standout people in all the in all the posts. Um, so, but the, the debt does have a have a have a bit of a concern for me. Um, you know, the, then payments have to be made. But you, but I suppose with with Iris, you've got two CEO, two co CEOs. Who have got vast experience in 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 in, in, in asset finance? So, you know, if they can't work out of a, out a plan together, then then there's a problem for all the miners. So, you know, I'm probably less concerned with Iris and Bit Farms than I am with Argo and Core Scientific and the yeah. likes. Of Greenwich, who I, I think I the market would tend to agree with you on that point as well. Yeah, and we're seeing a significant pricing in. And it, it, one question, I actually, want to pitch to you. What do you think happens from here with these big miners? Are they too big to fail? Like that one billion dollars of liabilities for core scientific, like that's a huge amount of money. Like Mass Mutual's involved with them, B Riley. Like we've seen a lot of these lenders out there. And these lenders, they do have some dry capital, right? Binance just launched a five hundred million dollar plan for rescuing distressed miners. We saw Maple Finance has a three hundred million dollar pool that they're assembling. Uh, I've seen a few others, NYDIG, I think, raised some money to deploy. Do you think that any of this dry capital is going to come in and fix some of these bad miners, or are we going to see significant restructuring on a case by case basis, and maybe even a piecemeal destruction of some of these companies? I mean, going back to your first question, no, no miner is too big to fail. We, we we realize that. I mean, you know, core scientific are compared to the rest of the miners just enormous from a mining perspective. Um, you know. Um, <sighs> It, it, it could nearly have the hash rate from the rest of the miners, and, and that would probably be within cause total hash rate. So it's you know they're a, they're a, they're a big they're a monster of a miner, but that growth strategy has come at a price, and it's it's really great when you're when you're looking at strategies when the Bitcoin price is fifty fifty five sixty thousand dollars a coin. You know we can all come up with a great strategy at that point in time. It's how to how to react to that strategy when it when the price drops to twenty thousand, and how many miners have had to rechange their um, their growth figures? I mean, we talked about Iris a minute ago, going to six exahash. Iris Energy had a had a, a target of fifteen point two exahash by September next year, um, up until about three or four months ago. So they saw the writing on the wall quickly, and they changed their strategy quickly as well. Um, and, and actually, they they came out and, and said we're, we'll probably achieve three point seven exash by the end of the year, and they're likely to beat that now. But they were being very conservative. They came out with a statement to the market saying we can't, you know, under the current uh, economic conditions, we don't feel that we can get to that position in time, um, as, as 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 previously um, communicated. So you know, to go from fifteen point two then to say three point seven, that's a drastic change. Um, Bit farms were at eight 
They came down to six. Argo were at 5.5. I mean, looking at today's uh, update, that's 2.5. There's nothing on there about Intel. So does that mean there's no money for the Intel chips? So that maybe that 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 deal's probably uh, gone, to, gone to the sidelines for the time being until more capital is acquired by Argo. They're in a better position. They also went down the route of starting to host miners now at, at Helios, where you know, six months ago when I spoke to Peter, that was one of the questions, would you consider hosting? You, you've built an enormous facility, 200 megawatts, and even with your strategy at the moment, you're only going to half fill that first phase. Would you look at, no, not, not, not going to host? No, no we, we've got plans to get to, you know, we're going we're gonna to fill out over the next two or three years the 800 megawatts facility. And yet, you know, six months down the line, we're now hosting. We're now having, you know, it's, it's cash flow. You've got to have that cash flow. And, you know, nobody nobody that will come on your channel or any channel will be able to give you a, a firm prediction on Bitcoin price. Um, we know that it is cyclical. We know it's cyclical. So we can look at the sort of the cycles. And it looks like we are in a cycle at the moment, you know, but there are a lot of macroeconomic factors out there that are, you know, are even putting more pressure on not just, not just, you know, Bitcoin, but, but the markets themselves. And there's, there's an argument to say Bitcoin's actually been following the NASDAQ in terms of like, you know, in, in, in terms of the last few months, it's been sort of like, you know, when you've had green days on the NASDAQ, you've had green days on Bitcoin. So it looks like there's been a little bit of correlation there. We're, we're in a cycle and I spoke with Jason Les of Riot, um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and he talked about the saying, you know, we're in this cycle, um, and he's got faith in Bitcoin. Um, you know, he runs one of the biggest miners. They've got no debt on the balance sheet at the moment, so they're sitting in a, in a, in a, in a really good position. They've even broke ground on a, on a one gigawatt site now to, in Navarra County. So they're going ahead, but at the same time of doing that, and they're, going, they're going to their shareholders and saying, we need to increase our our um, our, sh- our share our shares by about two hundred million, so that we are in a position to meet the requirements to build that site out. And so, you know, the shareholders are going to have to determine whether you know they see that you know potential dilution going forward, which would be literally doubling the amount of shares share capital. And so, you know, that that's what they're doing. But they're, they're, you know, they're going down that route there, and. Um, They've got a great facility at Windstone. It's getting closer and closer to being at full capacity. And so, you know, the next phase is what do we do next? And, you know, they've got a phase one at Navarro, which will bring in 400 um, megawatts of power. And so, you know, that and, and, and that's sort of 2023. So by the end of 2023, they're going to have 1.1 gigawatts of power supporting their mining facilities. Which is, which is, which is, you know, and, and, and that's in two facilities. That's, you know, and both facilities are in terms of, in terms of America, where everything's spread out. They're actually quite fairly close to each other. I think a couple hundred miles away. And all the, all the, um, infrastructure building those locations have been sourced lo- locally as well. So with you know, you know, so it's, so they've, they've gone down that route as well. So, um, you know, that's them. Other, other miners like Clean Spark, um, DMG, a smaller miner, DigiHost, again, no debt on the balance sheet. So they've managed so far to get to get to where they are. But again, any of their growth strategies in place, how do they make that jump to the next to the next level? And you know, you've only got three levers. You've only got dilution, debt, sell Bitcoin. Those are the three main levers that you know people argue, yes, there are. If you can get a an investor to come on board. Um, you know, to, to take a share of the company, that's that's a, maybe a fourth option there. You know, but the main three options, you know, just as I've outlined there, and with those three particular companies, they do sell their Bitcoin on a more regular basis. They've used their Bitcoin to manage their operational and their capital investment to get to where they are. But to, but with the likes of Clean Spark, I think they're over five X hash now, so they've joined the big leagues in terms of X hash. They want to get to twenty two by the end of next year. So in 15 months' time, they want to grow from five to 22. And, you know, we talked about the cost of miners now. Is now a good time to put those orders in for the, you know, but you've got to pay for them orders. So what's their strategy on paying for their orders? Are they going to have to go back to their shareholders and say, we're going to have to dilute, um, you know, a number of shares to get to the next to the next level? And by getting to the next level, we'll be in a position to 
mine or keep up with the difficulty and the hash rate, global hash rate increases and keep maintaining that level of, of mining that we've been doing. Just to jump in there, the, the one thing I do want to bring up is like this might signal some reprieve for Bitcoin miners. There's a few things that are coming. One is that there could be a decrease in network hash rate as the wet season ends in China. We still know there's about 10 to 20% of Bitcoin miners are actually still located in China and a lot of those miners will just turn off. Uh, so we'll possibly see some help there. And then also, you know, if some of these North American listed miners aren't able to continue running because of the cost of energy and the low cost of Bitcoin, that could help network difficulty as well. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this particular subject is it's very hard to be a Bitcoin miner. Just, you know, you have to use debt to leverage your position or a lot of people thought that was the best strategy. And now they're in a position where that debt is putting them into the grave and they might not be able to claw back out of it. And uh, at the same time, you needed that capital to be able to keep growing, right? To continue operating. So Riot was very smart and got some stuff placed beforehand and they're able to continue building uh, using other sources of capital. And I think other miners were trying to keep a pace with that using a more debt heavy model. And that model ended up not working. And a lot of that has to do with you know, larger macro concerns as well. And I think that's worth noting right now is that the Federal Reserve's decision to pivot and move up to 3% interest rates so quickly, the fastest in history, is really hitting the Bitcoin market quite heavily in a way that not many people expected. Interest rates might not keep continuing. We might see like a stop. Some people are expecting interest rates to sit around 3 to 5% and then the Fed will stop raising. That's a pretty heavy burden for a lot of these debt-heavy miners that were expecting 0% base rate and whatever rate on top of that that was priced in by whatever individual investment bank they're working with. They weren't expecting to have this heavy of debt interests on top of uh, their capital that they were taking out. So I think that is just notable in and of itself. Well, I'll hand it back to you. I mean, you know, Riot, Riot were, in a, were in a great position. They, when they purchased Windstone and they, they paid something like $650 million, they, they put a small amount of cash down payment, I think it was $80 million, and paid the rest in shares because the share price at that time was significantly higher than it is now. So, you know, um, that was a great deal for them in hindsight. Um, Marathon also have managed to raise significant amounts of debt with, with, uh, purely because, they're, you know, they're a big name on the NASDAQ in terms of uh, both of them US companies, both early NASDAQ entrants, both have lots of institutional support. And when you consider that both of them, from a from a, a from a production perspective this year, have not produced the Bitcoin that shareholders and the market expects, they're still head and shoulders above everybody else from a from a market capitalization. That the market still likes them two miners. Um, so you're always going to, you know, I mean, we're seeing Mara now start to energize a lot of these miners that have been held in garages for the past nine, twelve months. Um, and they're having a lot of their miners delivered again in the next few months if they can get them um, energized as well. You, you'll see the hash rate um, start to really ramp up for, for, for Marathon. But saying that, I think the market expected that hash rate probably nine months ago. So they're really, you know, in terms of finally getting there, it, it's, a, it's been a delay and it's been a challenge. Um, Riot also expect to get to 12.6 exahash by early in 2023 so that's more than double where they are now but they've got the facility they they they've nearly completed their um their 200 megawatt immersion um facilities what 100 megawatts is fully completed the other 100 megawatts is about to be completed and they're running the tests now on the immersion they're very they're very pleased with the way it's going at the moment um so that they're in a, they're in a good spot um Interesting to see how some of the miners can really grow their hash rate. As I say, you know, it's going to be a challenge. You mentioned three percent from from the from the Fed rate. That's the base rate. That's that's like that's not the interest rate. What these miners will be paying that you know that you know that, that there'll be a premium on top of that. And you know, even when interest rates were two percent lower than what they are now, miners were paying twelve, thirteen percent. And we've already highlighted Bit Farms had some loans at seventeen percent. So you know, over a year ago, there wasn't an appetite to lend miners, so you paid a premium. To, to get these loans. 2022 saw that change and the rates started to come down, but I think the rates will turn again now. I think I think for, for people wanting you know debt, I can't see the I can't see the interest rates. If the base rate increases, the Fed rate increases, I can't see 
interest rates from from investment banks coming down, I can see that increasing as well. They want their profit margin, and so it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. Um, so that leaves dilution as, as probably another another option. And when you look at the share price, and we've talked about the share prices averaging between eighty four and ninety nine percent down from their fifty two week highs, you're diluting a, lo- a low share price. You know, you could be having to dilute two or three times the size of the company just to get a small amount of funds to get you to a certain, you know, to to to, to maybe get a fifth percent increase in hash in hash rate. So it's it's a different it's a different time now to what it was last year. And whether some of the miners start thinking, you know, Hutt have played it very conservative. I think they're still Hutt are still not achieving their expected hash rate for December 20, 2021. So they, I think they wanted, I think, 3.35 exahash by December last year. It's at 3.07 in November. You know, so, and they've got a, they've got a target at 3.5 by the end of the year. Now, Hutt have got over 8,000 coins on their balance sheet. So they've got a reasonable amount of capital deployed. They've also um, uh, diversified into the data center um as, uh, for others, for other revenue streams, which is, which, uh, you know, again, it was a, it was probably a good decision to do that. They invested quite a lot of capital in in, in buying those day centres, but there's a there's a revenue stream coming in, so that's helping them cover their um, some some of their mining operations. And you know, they may they may be in the market and looking at some of the distressed assets coming out there because they've got facilities, they've got this new facility in Ontario that they probably could fit out, and if some of these distressed assets are still being sold, um. You know, we've seen the likes of Argo, we've seen the likes of Bit Farms, you know, core scientific selling mining rigs for to get cash flow in. Then Hutte, you know, um maybe could look at look at buying some distressed some distressed assets and, and uh, while they're, while they're at them sort of prices and get to that hash rate, you know, um, you know, in, in a t- more timely fashion. You get a lot of news over the last few weeks. Argo, Core Scientific, we didn't even talk about Compute North, but maybe for another day. And then a lot of other miners either struggling with debt, having to make large payments on debt, new financing models, selling machines. Some of these miners might be delisted. Some of them might make it out of this. We don't know. But uh, for everyone who's listened to the show, we thank you so much for your time and attention. Anthony, thank you again for your insights into the tea leaves of public miners and for digging through all the 10Ks and 8Ks and all the numbers and letters that the SEC likes throwing at us. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me.